So I think we should just get going. And our first pres presenter is Julie Cantas. Vancouver is considered one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and for good reason. We hosted the 2010 Winter Olympics. We have beautiful mountains, scenery, and beaches. For better or for worse, we have the Vancouver Canucks. But there's one other thing that I'd like to mention that Vancouver is really well known for, and I'll give you a hint, it's not the housing market. We get tons of rain. We had a record-breaking 28 out of 31 days of rain back in October. And although we Vancouverites like to think that we're tough and we can become resilient to the increased amounts of rainfall, what about our infrastructure? We had stormwater pipes that were installed back in the early 1900s that are still in commission. So how do we design our urban environment to account for these changes? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Cantus. And today I'll talk about how we can make our infrastructure more resilient to climate change. During this presentation, I'll provide a quick overview of some of the changes that we'll see uh, in the West Coast because of these impacts. Then talk about some stormwater management techniques that we can implement, including the usage of, of blue-green corridors, bioswales, and sand filtration systems. Climate change. It's supported by scientists and researchers all all around the world, and currently global mitigation efforts are underway to curb our greenhouse gas emissions. But unless real effort happens soon, we're likely going to see drastic changes that will likely become unavoidable. The effects of climate change will vary around the world, and in Vancouver, a study was done at the University of Victoria looking at what some of the changes will happen by 2050. By understanding some of these changes that we'll see, we can create proactive plans to prevent or even prepare for these impacts. So by 2050, we're going to see a half a meter increase of our global sea levels. This will cause global coastal flooding as well as soil erosion and damage to our coastal structures. We'll also see an annual temperature increase of 1.7 degrees. This might seem like an insignificant number, but the, by this increase of two degrees, it's likely going to cause water shortages in the summer. Finally, in terms of extreme weather, we're going to see those three-hour rainstorms 5.5 times more frequently than we used to. That's a lot of rain. So what, are, what is our city going to look like with this increased amounts of rainfall? Well, we're going to see more surface water flooding. We'll also see an increase in landslide risk due to a decrease in slope stability. This picture was taken in the West, West Vancouver, and I certainly wouldn't want to live there. We'll also see an increase in combined sewer overflows. A lot of our communities still use a combined sewer system, which combines our sanitary and our storm systems. During an intense heavy rainfalls, we're going to see this increased storm water exceed the capacity of these sewers and causes untreated water to discharge into our bodies of water. There are a lot of storm water management techniques that we can implement to reduce the amount of volume that's going into our infrastructure. One of those storm water management techniques that we can use is the usage of blue-green corridors. Blue-green corridors are essentially passages of land with integrated green spaces and systems of water which can, be act, which can act as a drainage system network. It's essentially using water and our vegetation to make our cities more livable. And rainfall is a resource we need to treat as such. So by integrating more blue-green corridors, we can go back into a more natural cycle. Instead of that, 55% of runoff that we're going to see in an urban center, we're going to see more of that water being infiltrated and evaporating back into your air. Another great green solution is the usage of bioswales. Bioswales are essentially specialized ditches with a gentle slope that can move our storm water. You'll generally see them right next to roadways in commercial and residential areas. Here's the typical cross-section of a bioswale. 
The vegetation, it, the vegetation soil medium is engineered in such a way so that only rainfall from extreme weather events will percolate into this perforated pipe, leading into our stormwater infrastructure. Although bioswales and blue-green corridors do a great job at decreasing the volume of water going into our infrastructure, what if our stormwater is polluted to begin with, if it's being run off from our lawns, our roads, or even industrial areas? Well, sand filtration systems do a great job of remo removing pollutants from our stormwater. It has a similar cross-section to bioswale, but instead it uses the sand to remove pollutants. It's great at recovering BOD, fecal coliform bacteria, and even large particulates. We can even enhance these sand systems through the addition of iron. By adding iron, we could also remove dissolved phosphorus. But what is dissolved phosphorus, and why do we care to remove it? Well, as some of you guys may know, phosphorus is an essential nutrient for plant and animal growth. But unfortunately, when it's actually in freshwater systems, it could cause these algae blooms. Only the amounts in the parts per billion can cause these toxic algae blooms, which is commonly seen in the west coast of BC. In conclusion, Vancouver is projected to have a lot more rain. And unfortunately, there's just going to be more extreme weather events. We simply need to adapt to them, and thankfully we have the tools, these green solutions that we can implement. With these integrated storm water, storm water management techniques, including the usage of blue-green corridors, bioswales, and sand filtration systems, we can make our infrastructure more resilient to these changes. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Why don't we start off with some audience participation? Raise your hands if you drove to BCIT today. Now, keep your hands raised if you enjoyed your commute to BCIT. Well, now we know the speeders are. All joking aside, the fact that most of us didn't keep our hands raised speaks volumes about how we feel about driving. Most of us find it to be monotonous, tedious, and just plain old boring. According to the Howard Health Study, we on average spend over four years of our lives in a car. That's over an hour a day that we're stuck at the lights, stuck behind another car, or stuck in a traffic jam. There must be some way for us to not be stuck and be productive when we commute. And there is the solution, driverless cars, a new way to get around, faster, more efficiently, and safer than ever before. Driverless cars are the future of mobility. They are the road ahead. Now, before I go any further, let me give you a quick overview of what I'll be covering in this presentation. And of course, I'll tell you what are driverless cars, why should you care about them, and are there any challenges in their way? So, what are driverless cars? Well, they're cars that can drive themselves. Okay, but how do they work? Well, when we drive, we use our senses, our arms, and our legs to drive the car. Similarly, driverless cars use sensors, actuators, and of course, computers to drive the car. The Google driverless car uses a mixture of laser, ultrasonic, radar, camera, and GPS sensors. The real secret sauce is that laser sensor, as it allows the car to see 360 degrees and capture millions of data points. The reason the laser is so important is because GPS isn't reliable enough. GPS can't see cars in front of you, and it can't draw a map around you as you drive. There's also an ultra a camera mounted on the rearview mirror, which uses image recognition software to identify road signs, traffic lights, and other elements in the driving environment. There's also four radars, which are used for distance measurement, three at the front and one at the back. Using all of these sensors, the car can recognize cones in a construction site and change lanes safely. There's also an ultrasonic sensor, which works alongside GPS to help the car's mapping. And using all of these sensors, the driverless car is able to drive safer and more efficiently than any human driver ever could. All right, driverless cars. Really cool piece of technology, but why should you care? 
Well, first of all, it's going to mean faster commutes. How? Well, today, the most unpredictable element in a car is the human driver. Driverless cars remove this unpredictability, and they can communicate to other driverless cars using radio waves. And by doing this, they share information such as how fast they're going, how far back they are, when they're going to make a lane change, and when they're going to make a turn. And their reaction speeds are much faster than any human being. And what this really means is that we can move away from the stop-go, stop-go traffic system that we have today to one that mixes the speed and vigor of the German Autobahn with the creative vitality of the intersections of Ethiopia. Another advantage of driverless cars is the fact that we'll have fewer cars. Today, every household has over, on average two cars. And 90, 95% of the time, they just sit there, parked. All of us who drove to BCIT today, our cars have been sitting in the parking lot since morning doing nothing. And this is a scene that is repeated across the world. Huge swaths of our cities are devoted to parking. With driverless cars, in the morning, you'll get dropped off of work, and then your car will go home and do what needs to be done. And at the end of a long day, rather than you having to go walk to the parking lot, get in your car, and drive home, you simply open up your smartphone, press a few buttons, and your driverless car comes and picks you up. Now, I know you're not thinking of grabbing a drink while your car drives you home, but maybe you're thinking, hey, I can get my driverless car to drive my kids to soccer practice. Or better yet, I can sit in the back seat and say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> Another advantage of driverless cars is the fact that we could have cars that don't crash. Today, every year, over a million people die in car accidents. And over the next 30 years, it's estimated that 40 million people will die. That's more than the population of our country. And 90% of these car accidents are due to human error. With driverless cars, car accidents can become a thing of the past. As with their sensors and communications abilities, they can see everything around them. So they can spot the pedestrian that's trying to cross the road or the motorcyclist that's trying to overtake them. And unlike a human driver, they never get tired, bored, or distracted. Their attention is always at the task at hand, driving and doing it safely. All right, driverless cars. They're sounding pretty great. They're gonna make our commutes faster and make our roads safer than ever before. But are there any challenges, any roadblocks, blind spots, any potholes in their way? The answer is yes. The first question that's asked is security. In a world where computers and intelligence is responsible for driving our cars, there is huge risk. What happens if they get hacked? In 2015, two researchers hacked in to a Jeep Cherokee vehicle and disabled its brakes remotely. This was the result. In the end, Chrysler had to recall 1.4 million vehicles to fix this bug. Now imagine this happening on the highway, and you are in the passenger seat. Another question that's asked is liability. Who is liable for the car? You or the car and the car manufacturer? Like imagine you're going down the highway and you get pulled over. What are you gonna tell the cop? That this is a Google driverless car. I'm not responsible for how fast it goes. Is he gonna believe you? Like really? Now these are just some of the questions that are being asked around driverless cars. There's others like morality. Who does the car save in a car accident? You or the pedestrian? And thankfully, a lot of work is being done and has been done to help answer them. Everyone from Google, uh, BMW, Tesla, Uber, and of course Google, who have driven over two million miles with their driverless cars are working hard. Because they know that driverless cars are the future of mobility. Within the next decade, we'll see the first driverless cars available for sale. And by 2050, all cars on the road will be driverless. Imagine a world where you never lose a loved one due to a car accident. Imagine a world where you get in your car, it takes you where to go, and you get out. You never have to worry about parking. Imagine cities which aren't clogged with traffic and parking lots which have been transformed into homes and parks. That is the future with driverless cars. That is the road ahead. Thank you for listening.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexander Bauman, and today I would like to share with you my second year mechanical design engineering project. This project is being developed by four students uh, in, our group, in our group, and is going to compete against three other teams in the second week of May. So I want to show you what we're working on. So the agenda for this presentation, I want to talk to you about the background of the project, what made us decide to work on this project, the problem statement, what problems we are trying to solve, what objectives do we have by the end of the project, what are the boundaries and what limitations we have in this project, what's our main task. Also, we're going to look into the quality function development graph, which is used to deployment graph, sorry, which is used to uh, design uh, engineering drawings and concept generations, and lastly, the budget. So we all know, as we just saw in our last presentation, that everything's becoming more automated and robots are going to eventually take on the world. <laughs> but the industries that we're targeting in this project, as we did some research on it, is the hobbyist industry, the military industry, the law enforcement industry, and lastly, the space and industry. The hobbies industry, we are starting to see more and more robots being used in the home and for any type of uh, applications that we may have at home. Military enforcement for search and rescue operations, law enforcement for surveillance, and space exploration to explore new planets. So the problem that we're trying to solve in this project, as the title says, is the design of a modular frame. We want to have a modular frame for the, project, for the robot that will allow different parts to be implemented into the design, into the robot, and will allow for easy parts to be put onto the frame and be taken apart. Also, we have to do a whole bunch of programming with, uh, I'm in the mechanical program, we don't have a lot of programming, but this is a definitely a challenge that we have to accomplish. Also, we have to make it autonomous, automated and it has to have a good user interface. And we have to design for assembly, which we have to prototype it by the second week of May. Some of the objectives that we want to achieve in this project, we want to have a working prototype. We want to achieve an efficient stair climbing, simple design for manufacturing, and lastly, to complete the project within the budget and the timeline. So the scopes and, and boundaries for this project, what we want to mainly achieve is have a good mobility, good stair climbing, efficient stair climbing that will outrun the other, the other teams, and a decent frame that would allow for multiple parts to be implemented and taken apart. So this looks, this is the QFD, quality function deployment graph. It looks fairly complicated. I don't want to bore you with this, but we're just going to look into one specific part of the QFD. We're going to look at the customer requirements. We looked at the customer requirements because this shows us what exactly we are designing and what do we want to have in our design. What do the customers want, basically? That's the question that we're answering. So first, we decided to aim for the hobbyist industry. This project, we don't want to go into military or law enforcement. It gets very complicated with the politics. So we decided, what do the customers want in a hobbyist robot that can climb the stairs? They want good graphic user interface. They want a modular design. They want it to be inexpensive and have a good battery life. Now moving on to the design part of our project, we use the morphology Sorry, the title, you can't really see it, but it's called a morphology. Now, morphology works by having all the sub-functions that the project has to perform and having different concepts for that function. For example, we want a function of traction. We want to have either wheels or tracks. For transmission, we can use uh, gears, direct transmission, belts, chains, and so on. So what we did is we chose our specific concepts for each function that we're trying to solve, that we're trying to have. So this is our first concept that we designed. This was all hand-drawn by some, one of our, a few of our team members. And as we can see here, it has two tracks right there and right there. 
and motors at the back of the rear back of the frame. This design is an aluminum frame. It's going to have an aluminum frame that would allow for multiple parts to be implemented into the robot. And you can easily take apart the, fra the, sorry, the tracks and implement wheels in onto it. Also, what's, no, what's the main part of this is that front angle. You may be asking, so how are you going to climb the stairs? So one of our team members uh, designed this front angle, as you can see there. It's basically how it works is as the motor, as the, sorry, as the robot is on flat ground, it would, as it's reaching the first step, it would touch the first step and it would incline the whole robot to be able to go up the stairs. So it would require a lot of torque and a lot of uh, a decent motor that we're going to have to buy that we already bought. And it would allow for a simple design, basically. That's what we were going for. Very simple design. The second concept that we came up with is it's very similar to the first concept. It also has a very modular frame, aluminum frame. And this concept requires a bit more parts. That's the downside of this concept. It also has an up, uh, sorry, excuse me, inclined front with a stabilizing mechanism, which you can also take apart, but it will require more manufacturing and more product, more work for our group. So we decided we want to stay simple. Why don't we just go with a front angle? We can easily bolt it onto the bottom and will allow for perfect modularity. Lastly, the budget for this project. We have a total budget of $300 that we have to, it's not that much, but everything that we're going to spend that money on is the frame, the mounting equipment, the tracks and wheels, and the sensors to make it autonomous. And the, the, the components that are supplied are the battery, the motors, and the controllers that we're programming. Lastly, to conclude my presentation, we're hoping that this will be all be prototyped by the second week of May and that it would increase our knowledge in the robotics field because we certainly see that this is a field that is increasing in demand in the next few years. Thank you. All right, my name is Steven Kohlhaas. Um, I'm a fourth year civil engineering student here at BCIT, um, and I'm the founder of the Amoeba Urban Design Lab. Our website's on there, it's audesignlab.com, and I encourage you after this presentation to come take a look. Um, it just goes a little bit deeper than what we're doing here. Um, so I'm gonna present to you on the Amoeba building system. Um, and so an Amoeba is a very unique biological creature. Um, it has uh, this innate ability to recreate itself over and over again. Um, and it's really resilient, so when it finds adversity, um, it, it replicates to survive. But what's really unique about an amoeba is that no matter what system you find it in, it, it has the ability to create major change. So right now in Vancouver, we're dealing with a housing crisis. Um, I believe Julie talked about that before. So I'm just going to read you some headlines. The Vancouver housing bubble risk is unmatched on the planet. Uh, Vancouver house, housing crisis, four decades in the making. Um, the Vancouver mayor on housing crisis. I never dreamed you would guess, get this intense. A boom like no other. Um, and finally, housing prices. As you can see, since 1977, about $200,000. Now it's about $400,000. So as a civil engineer, I look at this problem and I say, how can I affect change? How can I take this housing crisis head on? And I think about my good friend, the amoeba. So the amoeba, it, the amoeba building system is a modular, prefabricated building system where we take individual living units um, and we replicate them, and we uh, stack them in different heights and adjacencies to create um, apartment buildings. Um, a little point of pride, the Amoeba building system just recently won the STEM Spotlight Awards. We took first, price in, first place in sustainability um, and in the overall. So what you see on the left is the Amoeba 2.0, which is just a concept building. And then on the right is the Railtown River District, which is a twin tower um, building that I created with um, some of my fellow students for our fourth year capstone project. So, 
When designing the Amoeba building system, we took a three-pronged approach. Really, it's called the triple bottom line. And that means there's an environmental um, pillar to it. And that means we're using uh, renewable resources to build it, and we're trying to incorporate renewable resources into our building. The second is that there's a social aspect to it. So how are we including social services into our mixed-use urban uh, buildings? And finally is the financial. That's really taking on the housing crisis. How can we build a building that doesn't leave everyone house poor? Um, for the length of this presentation, I'm really just going to focus on the environmental and the technical side, and then touch a little bit about financial at the end. So um, the structural uh, material we use for the amoeba building system is called CLT, or cross-laminated timber. And what that is is basically taking dimensional 2x4s, um, laying them out, and then in layers perpendicular to each other, gluing them, pressing them, and then what comes out is a structural panel, very similar to concrete, except for three main differences. Um, it's a lot lighter than concrete. It uh, stops the one-way flow of carbon into the atmosphere. Basically, trees absorb carbon as they live. We cut them down, and that stores that carbon. And third, the warm, aesthetic um, feeling of wood um, just sort of you know, rubs me the right way, better than the concrete, if you will. Um, and so these panels are used both as vertical elements and horizontal floor elements. Vertical for walls, um, horizontal for floor. So the Basically, the, the main unit of the amoeba building system is what we call the unit cell, and this is your living modular. And there's four um, main aspects to it. There's four walls. Basically, it's a box. We may try to make it very simple for design. Um, the second aspect is one interior wall, and that runs longitudinally along with the um, exterior walls. And what this does is it helps um, break up the span of the floor system, as well as it acts as an architectural barrier between your sleeping space and your cooking living space. The third is our floor panels, which um, again are just CLT pa panels, but they're laid horizontally and perpendicular to the wall, very much like a joist in your house. And finally is 4x4 four four dimensional blocking, um, which we use to create an airspace between the CLT floor panel and your walking floor. And that's where we put your mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, basically out of sight, out of mind. And all of this is prefabricated down at ground level, and then we fly them up. So, um, something unique about the Amoeba building system, we did some calculations, and each unit approximately um, takes out 33 tons of carbon, which equates to about five cars off the year, or five cars off the road each year, um, which isn't that much, but if we build a building with 100 units, we're taking 500 ca cars off the road each year. So how does it all get put together? Um, again, I've shown the Railtown River District. Um, we like to use mixed-use mix um, living, so we do a concrete podium where we use, uh, or we, where we put in uh, commercial and residential, and then we use a, uh, a concrete core for your uh, elevator and stair core, and then we put the living units up and we fly them around that stair core and hook them into the, uh, the main building systems. So a single uh, bedroom unit is roughly 730 square feet, and a two bedroom unit is 925 square feet. So the financial aspect about this, um, there's a lot going on, but I really get two questions when I talk about this, and I talk about this a lot. Um, is first, isn't the cost of CLT construction more expensive today than typical concrete construction? And the answer is yes, today it is. But with building codes changing, the perception of tall wood in the public changing, and more construction companies building these buildings, we're going to see that cost come down um, as contractors get used to it and the, you know, putting up the modular system. Also, the cost of land is really the, the crutch. <laughs> really the crutch in um, the whole building thing. It's not really the building materials. Um, and to that I say, that's why we're focusing on sort of a prefabricated modular system. So the faster that we can put these buildings up, the less, uh, the less expensive it's gonna be because those building uh, loans are gonna come down and the interest paid on those loans are gonna come down. So to wrap this thing up, um, I just wanted to talk about the circles of influence that I see in engineering. And I think there's a lot of perception that says, you know, engineering is really about the balances of mathematics, about forces and mechanics. And that, you know, urban living and communities are about the, those three pillars of uh, triple bottom line, environmentalism, social services, um, and financial stability. But where we find true progress in engineering is when those two circles of influence come together. And that is the amoeba building system. Thank you very much. Food. It is an essential part of our daily struggle to survive. 
And the discovery of agriculture has been a cornerstone of human civilization. However, it has also been one of the most ecologically destructive aspect of human society. And its impact on Earth is unprecedented. And yet, how many of us here can really answer the question, where do our food come from? Take this apple, for instance. I'm sure everyone here has had an apple in the last week or so. How old would you say that apple was from the day it's been picked? Nine months? Eleven months. The average age of an apple at a grocery store. It looks quite good for an apple that's nearly a year old. In fact, most of the fruits and vegetables that are found in our grocery stores come from far-flung places and bombarded with chemicals and pesticides to keep them fresh. We tell ourselves that this is the price we pay for the convenience of cheaper produce. But is it really worth it? Is this the only way? I say no. I believe that there is a way to produce fresh produce to more people without the ecological havoc we pay for. And that solution is vertical farming. Before we go and roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty with the topic of vertical farming, I'm going to go over a quick overview of what our current food system is and the problems it has how vertical farming can address some of those issues, and the challenges that we still have left to overcome. So, go, to go back to this apple, what is so bad about this apple? Well, most, some of our apples are from Chilliwack and Okanagan, but many of them are from places like the United States, New Zealand, and even South Africa. And in order for that apple to survive this arduous journey, it must undergo chemical cellular to stop cellular degradation and be placed in cold storage. Now, while this process has given this apple its youthful look, it also strips a lot of the nutrients and antioxidants found on the surface of the skin. Essentially, you get a ball of sugar. Now, oh my, I apologize. Um, so while we only pay 50 cents for an apple, we ignore the decreased nutritional value of this apple, as well as the labor inequalities that was required to pick that apple, the agricultural runoffs that flow into our oceans, and the carbon dioxide emitted to bring us this apple. Now, once you start thinking about how many apples there are in a grocery store, and how many grocery stores there are in this country, the true cost of this apple starts to add up. Now, you may be thinking, if the problem with our current food system is so big, how can we possibly fix it? And that, a good place to start is vertical farming. So as you may have guessed, vertical farming is where you take the horizontal growing area and place them vertically. This also allows you to grow more vegetables in smaller amounts of land, and in fact, Cornell's vertical farm facility produces 23 times more heads of lettuce than the typical Californian lettuce farm. Also, rather than using soil, vertical farms use hydroponic or aeroponic technology to... Uh, uh, oh. uh, infusing it with nutrient-rich waters. This allows us to use 70 to 95% less water than the typical conventional system. And it frees us from the reliance of fertilizers and pesticides. 
Now, how can we provide enough light to each of these plants? Fortunately, plants are kind of dumb, and they only need a certain wavelength to produce enough energy. So using efficient LEDs, only using the blue and red spectrum, it's enough photons to grow vegetables using less energy than conventional lighting systems, and has the benefit of being able to grow it all year round. Now, this all sounds great, but what are the, some of the challenges to widespread adoption? The most significant disadvantage to vertical farming is the high initial capital cost. It is expensive to build or renovate an indoor space and install the necessary equipment to grow vertically. But while the startup costs are high, the larger yield and shorter growth cycles of those crops typically pays off much quicker than typical conventions. Also, vertical farms are more reliable and financially stable. They're not dependent on the weather, and therefore, severe weather elements like droughts and floods won't have the same impact. Another problem is the availability of land in the city. While land prices and lack of space is a major concern, vertical farming can produce food in underused areas like empty parking lots or abandoned where, uh, industrial sites. And since it is already in the city, transportation costs and carbon emissions are drastically cut. In fact, Instead of shipping vegetables from all over the world, you can grow it right here in a place like Burrard Inlet and other underutilized lands, growing more local jobs here. Finally, the current technology has limitations on the type of yield and vegetables that we can grow. However, researchers are looking into more efficient lighting and more efficient growing methods, like this drum method, where it produces seven times more output than conventional farms. They're also breeding shorter crops to fit more in smaller spaces. As this technology develops, the costs associated will drop as well. So, in conclusion, vertical farming has the potential to address some of the larger food problems in our world today. It isn't hard to imagine a future where vertical farming could have a real impact on the amount of pesticides and fertilizers that we use, the water we waste, and the fuel we burn. It could address food insecurities in developing nations and obesity concerns in the West. Vertical farming can offer solutions to two of the biggest problems we as a human species face today, environmental sustainability and human well-being. As BCIT students, we have the opportunity to take a bite out of our current food systems and grow a brighter, greener future. Thank you. Look up there in the sky. Is it a bird? Or is it a plane? No, that's Superman. He must be heading out to save lives, just like a superconductor. Hello everyone, my name is Dean Tambolin, and today I'm gonna to be talking about superconductors and how, just like Superman, they could save your life. On the agenda for today's presentation, I'll be starting off by delving into the definition of a superconductor. This will then lead into how MRI machines that utilize superconductors to save lives. And then I'll wrap up with the future of superconductors and a question and answer period. So let's get started. Superconductors. Many of you may have heard about superconductors and their capacity to create levitation, such as the image shown. But they're much more than this. And a simple definition as to what a superconductor is, it's a material that has little to no resistance. And to help you understand what that means, let's first look at a normal conductor. The atoms within this material vibrate quite violently, 
as shown. So when a current is introduced, the electrons actually collide with those vibrating particles. And these collisions represent resistance and also introduce losses into the system in the form of heat. Now let's compare that to our superconductor. So the same material can be cooled down to an incredibly cold temperature. And this causes those same atoms to move much more slowly. In some extreme cases, they even stop. So when the current is introduced, there are no more of those collisions because the electron is actually able to make its way easily through those atoms. Now, this means there's no more resistance and no more losses, and the superconductor also has the added benefit of being able to generate enormous magnetic fields. But we'll touch on that a little bit later, because I want to keep the focus on temperature for right now. So every superconductor has something that is known as a critical temperature. And it's a temperature value that represents the point where the material becomes a superconductor. And these critical values are quite extreme, normally around 10 Kelvin, or negative 263 degrees Celsius. And that temperature may be difficult to comprehend, so let's compare it to the coldest temperature that has ever occurred naturally on Earth. That was negative 89.2 degrees Celsius. So you can see there's quite an extreme difference between these two temperatures, and it means that these critical temperatures are quite difficult to achieve. But that wraps up what a superconductor is. Let's move on to the more interesting part of the presentation. How the superconductor actually save lives? Well, that's through magnetic resonance imaging. And this process is facilitated through a machine like the one shown. And these machines can be found throughout Canada in hospitals and clinics. And the most important part of this machine is the superconductor. And a typical superconductor used in MRI machines is niobium titanium. And this material is drawn out into a long wire stretching multiple kilometers long. It is then wound around a core and bathed in liquid helium to help it reach that critical temperature. And once the temperature is reached, a current is introduced, causing the wire to generate a magnetic field. And this magnetic field is incredibly strong, normally around one and a half to three Teslas, which is hundreds of orders of magnitude stronger than a typical magnet you find around your house, say on your fridge. And this magnetic field acts on the body from foot to head. And it does some interesting things. But before we go over that, let's first go over some basic biology. So as I'm sure you all know, the body is primarily composed of water. This means there's a lot of hydrogen atoms within your body. And these atoms are like miniature Earths. They have a north and south pole and an axis on which they spin. So when that magnetic field acts on these hydrogen atoms, it actually causes them to align based on that axis. But unfortunately, they're in a static state at this point. Not much is going on. So we need to introduce change, because change is measurable. And that change can be introduced by something known as a transmitter coil, or another coil of wire that will generate a new magnetic field. And this one acts perpendicular to that of the superconductor. And this new magnetic field acts as a radial frequency signal, or a source of energy that those hydrogen atoms can absorb. So this absorption of energy actually causes the hydrogen atoms to jump up to a higher energy state and actually switch the direction that they're spinning. And this process can be applied at a processional frequency, and it creates something known as nuclear magnetic resonance. So essentially, these hydrogen atoms are constantly switching the direction that they're spinning. And this causes those same hydrogen atoms to release their own energy. And this energy can be captured by a receiver coil or another coil of wire. And it turns that energy into information representing the position of every single hydrogen atom within a particular cross-section. And that information can be sent to a computer, which then generates a plot of all those hydrogen atoms. So you'll see on the left, that's a normal MRI scan of the brain. There's nothing out of place. But if you compare it to the one on the right, you'll notice there's a dense concentration there. That's a pituitary tumor. And the reason the MRI is able to detect that abnormal tissue is because abnormal tissue absorbs more water, meaning there's more hydrogen atoms present and this is reflected in the MRI scan. And that wraps up what an MRI machine does. But now at this point, you may be wondering to yourself, with these enormous magnetic fields acting on the body and actually causing the atoms within me to behave differently, should I expect any repercussions from an MRI scan? Well, I'm happy to report there are no risks associated with MRI scans. And this is great news because there are other imaging techniques such as 
X-rays and CAT scans, which put you at risk for things like skin irritation, or in extreme cases, cancer. But MRI machines, they do have a negative impact on something. And that's on the environment. Because as I mentioned earlier, MRI machines rely on helium. And for those who don't know, helium is a resource that we are rapidly running out of. It can only be extracted from natural gas and oil wells. So when those run out, we run out of our source of helium. So with that knowledge, it really starts to beg the question, are MRI machines all that sustainable? Well, there's a potential solution to this dilemma. It comes in the form of yttrium barium copper oxide, a high temperature superconductor. And this material has a critical temperature of negative 173 degrees Celsius. While it's still extreme, it means that we can move away from helium and instead utilize another gas like nitrogen, which is incredibly abundant in the Earth's atmosphere. And this is something that companies out in, out in industry have started to recognize. Siemens, for example, have developed a fully functioning prototype utilizing yttrium barium copper oxide, and they plan on having a commercially available product ready within the next few years. And this change is absolutely necessary to make MRI machines more sustainable because the world needs MRI machines. They save lives. And these machines are only possible because of the amazing abilities of superconductors. And I hope now at this point, you'll see superconductors from my perspective. The perspective that superconductors really are like Superman, that they are the superheroes of the material universe. And I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. And are there any questions? start with a question. How many of you are familiar with a scene and sight that looks like this? All right. Now for those of you who raised your hands, what descriptive words come to mind when you see this? Ugly. Ugly? Anything else? Dirty. All right. Now I've asked this question many times before, and the words I get are chaotic, disturbing, ugly, traffic, every sorts of negative connotation you can think of. Now, when you ask me what I see when I look at a picture like this, I see improvement. I see infrastructure. I see work. But above all else, I see municipal infrastructure and construction. My name is Stacey Nevis. I'm a second year civil engineering student, currently employed with the city of New Westminster. And I fell in love with infrastructure right there at the corner of Ewan Avenue and Derwent Way. This was the first project I held a coordination role in. And that day, I saw that ugly, horrific, disgusting, dirty sight turn into that. A paved road, beautiful new pavement, something that was there to connect a community. It aided in goods movement. It allowed children to walk to and from school. Above all else, there were some underground upgrades that were done that you can't even see there. And really, all of that encompassing is what municipal construction really is. So today I'm here to talk to you about municipal construction. We're going to talk about all aspects of it, the good, the bad, sometimes the ugly. But at the end of the day, it's a beautiful piece of infrastructure. So I'm going to follow through with a little bit of the U and Avenue project, mostly because that's what I'm very passionate about and was the first opportunity I had to have a coordination role. So our outline today is what is municipal construction? We'll tie into the U and Avenue project and kind of guide you through that with some background get into why it's important, which is pretty much the good. We'll get into who it impacts, which I've labeled a bit bad, and what can go wrong. Now that's kind of the ugly. So what is it? Well, besides the definitions that Google gives you, it's really any improvement, any construction that's done for the inhabitants of a city or a municipality. So why is it important? Why am I here talking to you about this? Well, we see municipal construction every day. We see it everywhere. It's what gives us a livable community. It brings you potable water in the morning for you to drink. It takes away that sewerage for treatment. It builds that road that gets you from point A to point B, gets you here. And we also do things like aesthetically pleasing amenities to make you want to be there and to walk through these new sidewalks and multi-use pathways. Now I mentioned I'm going to tie it to Ewan. So anybody familiar with Ewan Avenue? couple of you. So it's a 2.5 kilometer stretch of roadway in New Westminster. 
It spans from the tip of the Fraser River and the island there all the way to the boundary with Richmond. Here we go, a Google photo of you and Avenue. Not the most aesthetically pleasing corridor. There's ditches running along both sides of the roadway. We have some cracked pavement, which it might be a little difficult for you guys to see. <laughs> Sidewalk only on one side of the street. Some people claim that it wasn't aesthetically pleasing, not necessarily the safest place to walk to school. Aha, the conceptual drawing of what you and Avenue will look like. Look at this. This is a road you want to walk on, or a sidewalk you want to walk on, or a road you want to drive on. We have extended sidewalks, new pavement. We even put in a traffic signal to replace the four-way stop. All of this municipal infrastructure, this beautiful infrastructure, was the good that comes from this project. But with everything good, sometimes there's bad. So who does it impact? Well, most impacts with construction or municipal construction at that is detours and road closures and having to get your way to and from a site going through this construction site. It impacts those residents. So they, it's difficult for them to get home sometimes, but in addition, sometimes we have to take off their services offline in order to tie into, aha, new infrastructure. It also affects stakeholders. So those are the local business owners, the institutions. Generally, it's hard for you to get to those places. And commuters, try getting through a site like that. Now this, pardon the blurriness, this is an actual photo that was sent to me. We'll call them from a concerned stakeholder. As you can see here, it was not easy to navigate through that site. The vehicles were actually traveling on the sidewalk. And as a result, we did a little digging and what happened was a little bit of lack of communication, a little inadequate coordination, and at the end of the day, it was resolved. I think it's a good time to say, BCIT does a really good job with promoting communication with all of our programs. Because really, if you had good communication skills, chances are something like this would have not happened. But it could get worse, the ugly. This is when things get wrong. Generally, I find that communication and coordination, they tie hand in hand. And at the end of the day, issues that come arise with a project are sometimes poor planning, poor estimating, poor scheduling. Back to our UN Avenue program, or project, sorry. Now with UN Avenue, it started off as a beautification project. It was just meant to build a sidewalk that was a little bit wider. It was there to pave some roads. Now a regional, infrastructure had to be upgraded and as a result we went and upgraded all of the utility works. As you can see, water main break can turn something ugly pretty quick. In addition to that, our budget allocation went from a 14 million dollar project to a 24 million dollar project and we're still looking at some of that. And to make matters even a little bit more worse, the schedule was a two-year project. Well we're at three years and still counting. I think we're starting phase three within the next couple of months. I came back to school, so I can't be definitive with when that project's gonna start up again. But I wanna leave you with, despite some of these ugly connotations and things that happened, this is obviously substantial completion, because as mentioned, we're continuing on with construction. But you see here, it went from that two ditches along the roadways to a sidewalk where children can walk to and from school. New pavement there. We're gonna be putting in landscaping. So what I really want you to take away from today is when you see something like this outside your door, I don't want you to think, oh, this is ugly, it's gonna be disturbing, it's gonna take forever, how am I gonna get home? I want you to think, hey, it's gonna be really nice. They're gonna improve this infrastructure. So think about the positive with, constru with municipal construction. So I wanna thank you for listening to me talk about something I've been passionate about for over a decade. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Is everyone still awake? Yeah, okay, great. All right, so I was asking you guys, does anyone here recognize this logo at all? No one? How about now? Hey, everyone, right, from a show of hands? Perfect. Now, does anyone have an idea about what actually goes on behind a Google search or how they're able to spit back results so fast? Well, I will be speaking about that shortly. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Lehmitt from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Program, and today I will be speaking to you all about building automation analytics. Now, I know that probably sounds like a mouthful, 
but I will be breaking it up into small pieces so we will all understand what it is and why it should be everywhere. And before I get started, I'd first like to mention one thing. Before coming to BCIT and actually working with this technology and industry, I never thought I would get so excited about automation and analytics. And I hope by the end of this presentation, I can transfer some of that excitement to you all. So let's get started. First, what is building automation? Next, what is analytics and what does it look like when these two are combined? I will then be discussing how does it work as well as what are the benefits and most importantly, why it should be everywhere. So what is building automation? In simplest terms, it is the automatic control of a building's heating, cooling and ventilation with the help of a building automation system. The objective of the building automation system is to maintain building comfort while achieving efficient operation where energy consumption is low as well as maintaining the, uh, the building comfort of the building as well as reducing equipment wear and tear. So you don't want to overwork your equipment at all. Next, what is analytics? Analytics is the discovery, interpretation and communication of data. With the help of programming, we are able to digest all this data, interpret what it means and spit back results extremely fast, just like a Google search. And one of the greatest values of analytics is being able to program once and leave your computer there to continuously do what you've asked it for. Now with summer quickly approaching, I thought it was time to get back into shape. So I decided to do a quick Google search. I don't know if you guys can see there, but it says how to get a six pack for summer. So I did this quick Google search and check this out. I got over 4 million results in only 0.7 seconds. This is because there's an analytics engine running in the background, digesting all the data out there, interpreting what it means and spitting back results that might be important to me. So now that we know what a building automation system is and how analytics works, what does it look like when the two are combined? Well, let's take this air conditioning unit, for example, because there's actually one supplying air to this room right now. So we've got our return air on the top, as well as our supply air down on the bottom. We have two fans and three dampers to control the airflow. And depending on the temperature that the room, that the people in the room are asking for, these heating and cooling coils will heat or cool the air depending on what the occupants would like. So the control of these fans, dampers, heating and cooling coils is automated with the building automation system. But how do we know that this system has been optimized to consume the least amount of energy while maintaining building comfort? After all, mistakes are made all the time. For example, when I first did my Google search, this was my first result. And I don't think that's going to get me in shape for summer. So as we can see, mistakes are made all the time. But thanks to analytics, we can determine if this system has been optimized or not with three simple steps. First, acquire all the trend log data related to how this air conditioning unit is performing. Next, analyze the trend log data and compare it with how a perfectly programmed air conditioning unit should perform. And thanks to analytics, we can determine which systems are working the way they should and advise our building operators which ones will need some attention. So in the past, building operators and energy managers used to take building schematics, utility bills, and trend log data to this very same thing with manual calculations. Now imagine doing this on 50 air conditioning units. You'd be like this guy, calculating forever, and it doesn't look like he's gonna be done anytime soon. So some of the problems analytics can find include temperature not reaching set point, kind of like how we'll walk up to a thermostat and it'll never get warm in the room. And I think we can all agree that's happened to us at one point or another. Then we have overcycling equipment, which involves fans, pumps, or dampers opening and closing or turning on and off contrary to how they should. Then we have simultaneous heating and cooling, which involves heating the room here and cooling it over here. It doesn't really make sense. And then we have continuously running equipment, which involves leaving the equipment on in manual mode Generally speaking, we don't need to leave the equipment running when no one is in the room. You're simply wasting energy. So today, building operators tend to be reactive instead of proactive. For example, they are so focused on trying to fix the problems associated to the rooms where people are complaining 
that they don't have the time to consider which systems will fail next and which systems are consuming excessive amounts of energy. <clears throat> but thanks to analytics, building operators are able to spend less time finding the problem and more time fixing the problem, which relays into benefits such as increased energy savings, as well as reduced equipment wear and tear, reduced maintenance time and cost, and most importantly, increased building comfort. So you guys must be interested to hear what some of the results are that building automation analytics can do. Well, for a small school here in Vancouver, 23 of the air conditioning units were not optimized for performance. They were consuming excessive amounts of energy, but thanks to analytics and taking some steps towards optimization, the energy consumption was reduced by 49%. This relayed into energy savings of thousands of dollars per year. Now everyone, take a moment and think about the benefits that could come from optimizing BCIT. So in conclusion, we now know what building automation is and what it looks like when the power of analytics are combined. This combination allows for increased energy savings. And with the benefits I spoke about today, it is clear that we need to apply analytics on all building automation systems. And with the potential energy savings out there, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean. And uh, so this is a pleasure to give the award away to, uh, to the students as selected by the audience. Now it's become uh, customary. We start off with a bit of, uh, for the third prize of $300, could I please uh, ask for a drum roll by the traditional form of thigh slapping? And that goes to Julie Cantes. So Julie's gonna come up and Scott is gonna take the, uh, the traditional photo. Congratulations, Julie. Well done. Good for you. Over there. All right, well done, Julie. And now we, uh, for the second prize of $400, now this has got to be a combination of the thigh slapping and the foot stamping. And second prize of $400, Dean Tambaline. I think I've given uh, maybe three awards to Dean. He's just too tall, and I'm glad he's leaving next year. <laughs> and now, finally, the big first prize of $500. Uh, thigh slapping, foot stamping, and a big woo. So here we go. First prize goes to Stacy Nevers. Big round of applause, all our winners, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our Associate Vice President of all kinds of things, <laughs> James Rout, of everything. Everything that has to do with thinking and learning and teaching. Thanks, Jean. I'd just like to thank all of the presenters today. Uh, on behalf of the judges, we thought everyone did a really fantastic job. This is a very difficult uh, thing to do, but we do have uh, our three uh, winners. Um, and I'll start with third prize, $400, goes to La La Land. No, wait, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, that's wrong. Julie Cantes. Thank you. 
And second prize for $700 goes to Dean Tambaline. And first prize, $1,000, goes to Navtej Air. Thank you all very much. I'll pass it back to Jean. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very, thank you very much. Uh, well, that was an amazing event, and uh, I hope that we'll uh, we'll have more of you stepping up next year to try to win this prize. It's it's very worth doing, and we've we've all learned a lot about different topics that we hadn't been expecting to and we, we I think we go away with something else and one reason I love this event is that there's a lot of gloomy things out there in the world that we worry about but when we see young people who can speak the way that they've been speaking expressing their ideas and have a passion for things like improving our cities and improving our environment I think we can all go away feeling a little bit more optimistic about the future and you hear students like this, and we're very proud of them, so thank you. Thank you.